ladies and gents, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to you all. It's a great pleasure to welcome you. Uh, my name is Mark Peters. I have a very, very small role to play today, and that is just to MC the event and int introduce our guest speaker. Um, uh, to my colleagues from Business Ireland, South Africa, from the Euro European Union Chamber, the Belgian Chamber of Commerce, the Spanish Chamber of Commerce, the Italian Chamber of Commerce, and the South African Portuguese Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, welcome to you and everyone else that I, I haven't included in that round. Um, uh, uh, my name is Mark Peters. I will be your MC and host for the next uh, 90 minutes or so. Um, we are going to kick off in literally one minute. Um, Firstly, let me introduce you very quickly um, to Hecky van der Westhuizen, Dr. Hecky van der Westhuizen, who recently completed his PhD in the space of leadership. Hecky is a, a colleague and friend, and he had offered to present uh, his book on stepping stones to self-leadership. We thought it was a good idea. We tried to run uh, webinars on a regular basis throughout COVID and we thought this one um, was a really suitable um, uh, program for us. And it was amazing. We, we have uh, for many months now had uh, strategy, marketing, all kinds of economic issues, but the self-leadership uh, had a greater uptake. So welcome, welcome to all of you. Hickey has uh, been an executive and senior general manager and managing director in a number of corporate environments. And a couple of years ago, stepped out to complete his PhD and start his own business. So he's going to talk to you about that. We will make the recording available. It'll take a day or so. We hope to have it loaded on the website by Friday for you. If any of your colleagues miss a piece or need to leave early and would like to catch it, you're welcome to do that. You are welcome to put yourselves on mute. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, you're also welcome to switch your cameras off uh, for now, if that helps you. Um, and then uh, possibly do two things to help me. One is, uh, as we go along, um, if you would like to post your questions, I will field them in about 45 or, or 50 minutes. We have allowed some time at the end of the session for Q&A. Uh, a couple of people have sent me questions through uh, already, so we will we will deal with that at the end of the presentation. Um, so you're welcome to to hang on and do that. Um, uh, was there anything else? Uh, I think that was that was all. Please do put those questions in the chat box if you don't mind. And Hecky, I'm going to welcome for one last time. We have about 30 people online. Welcome to everybody. And Hecky, it's over to you. Thanks, Mark. Much appreciate it. Just want to confirm that you can see that. Well, good. Yes, we can see it now, Hecky. Okay. Yep, it's fire away. On mute there. Right, so I just want to, uh, thanks for the intro, Mark, much appreciate it. Um, I just want to, from my side, say thank you very much to, first of all, everybody on this, on the, on this call, on the session, and to everybody that um, made today possible. It's my privilege to share with you um, my experiences around a topic, the topic of self-leadership is very close to me and I feel very passionate about. So I just, Aki in a nutshell, um, Mark alluded to it, I ran the treadmill for hard enough, for long enough, and in 2020, I decided to exit um, the corporate world to take sabbatical and to finish my PhD at UJ in personal and professional leadership. I also in that year started my, 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 my company, Soldati, which is an acronym for Southern African Leadership Development and Training Institute. And where I have the, the real privilege, if I can call it that, um, to do leadership development, which is something that I'm absolutely passionate about. Uh, and that's, that's something that's, that's very close to art. And that's, that's not only my passion, but it's also my mission in life, not 
to only develop leaders from an organizational point of view, but also I'm involved in youth leadership on different levels, which I, I do pro bono. Right, so my commitment to self-leadership literally started in 1986, um, when as a standard, standard A pupil, I read the, the Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale, uh, way before any digital or, or virtual uh, things were, were possible. And I, I, I went to visit uh, somebody in Pretoria and I, I bought this, this book. And that's where my thought process started many, many moons ago around self-leadership and what it entails. To the point that 35 years later, I wrote a book on it, um, where I'm sharing with you my thoughts and my experiences uh, around the topic. And literally today is about giving you the overview. It's, it's, a, it's a summary version of what I'm writing about in the book, and it's literally just taking some highlights from the book. So why the title of the book, um, Conquering My Nemesis, you might ask, with the M-E in Nemesis in capital letters. Well, I think this quote uh, addresses that that answer quite quite nicely or, or provides an answer. Because at some point in my life, I realized that the only thing that's standing between myself um, and greatness is, is me. I am actually my worst enemy in life. And I, in that, with that came the realization that, listen, I, I need to do something about this. And I've got a, some feeling that at that point as well, that I'm, I wasn't, or I'm not the only person that feels that way. So why write a book on, on self-leadership, you might ask. Um, it's certainly not to make money out of it, um, but it's to share. And to share tools, techniques, and methods through my experiences um, with you and with everybody else out there in the hope that it will make a difference in other people's lives as far as their self-leadership journey is concerned and the success thereof. So my invitation to you today is, is to reflect. Please take today the, the 50, 60, 70 minutes of this, the complete session, um, including Q&A, to hold up the mirror to yourself and look at yourself in the mirror and reflect on your life and your journey around self-leadership. So just a couple of disclaimers I would like to share with you up front. First of all, by no means am I perfect yet at self-leadership, but intentionally I focus on it that every single day uh, to try my best to be, to be successful as far as that's concerned. Uh, my intentions are also not to make you feel guilty. Certainly not. I will probably make you feel uncomfortable, which I think might be a good thing. And then I hope that today will assist you to get your self-leadership journey on track, or at least if you're already, if it's already on track, to assist you in accelerating that journey towards success. And then I have to almost apologize. I like quotes. And there's a lot of quotes I want to share with you today. Why? Because I think it's a good way of, 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 of stimulating discussion. It is um, a reminder of all of us, for all of us as well, that you know sometimes we think it's only us that are battling with stuff, um, and then we get quotes from very famous people, and we realise, but hang on, we're not alone. And then also, it, it supports the content in terms of what I want to want to want to share with you today, and also in the book. So, what is self leadership or personal leadership? Brian Tinkazan defined it as the practice of intentionally, with an emphasis on intentionally, the practice of intentionally influencing our thinking, our feelings, and our behavior in terms of achieving our objectives. I do feel, though, that uh, self-leadership is much more, more than that. To me, it's about achieving our full potential. It's about living a legacy that makes us, you and I, proud. And it's also about laying the foundation to better lead others. So at Saldati, just digressing a little bit, our leadership uh, development framework um, starts, and I'm not going to take you through the whole framework, don't stress, but it starts with leading yourself, because I firmly believe that's where it all starts, and that's where it all should start, in terms of mastering ourselves, leading ourselves. And then we start focusing on leading individuals, and finally, leading teams. So my PhD was focused uh, in the five to six years that, I, that I've actually done it, it was focused on the leadership development process. And specifically, from organizational point of view, in Southern Africa, what I always thought about was what makes leadership development, the process of leadership development successful. And that's why I did my PhD on, on that exact topic. And five things came out, bearing in mind that the leadership development process 
what makes it a success is different uh, per level per, per level of, of, of leadership rather. There were five things that came out after interviewing all these leadership development experts in Southern Africa and that were unopposed from all eight of them. And they all said these five things apply to the leadership development process regardless of the level of leadership. And I'll click, I'll click, quickly just um, share it with you. The first one was that there must be alignment between the leadership development process and the strategy of the organization. Secondly, that each leader must have an individual development plan, which needs to be revised over time, as opposed to using a shotgun approach. It needs to be a focused approach per individual leader. Then thirdly, senior management must provide long term support to the leadership development process as a strategic priority in organization. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why I, when I approach companies, I approach only one person, and that's the CEO. Why? Because it's simple. If the CEO doesn't support the process, frankly, a lot of time and a lot of money would be would be wasted. And then the fourth one was the culture, the culture and values of the organization, and, and taking that into consideration as far as the people and the organization is concerned. And then finally, the leadership development process should be supporting or be in service of the soft stuff and the hard stuff. So this is all good and well, and it's great to have this feedback. But I can assure you that none of this means anything. If we don't have leaders in our organizations that actively and seriously and intentionally focus on their, on their self leadership, on their personal leadership and, and, and making that a success. I've worked for many, I've worked in a number, put it, put it this way, in a number of executive teams where there were prima Madonnas, guys that don't have EQ. I don't know how they got to where they were, but the point is we can't afford to have those kind of leaders in our organizations. So my suggested approach around today's session, just to, in terms of simplifying it, is that you pick the top three areas. If you buy the book, obviously you've got more chance, more time to reflect um, and, and, and go through it in, in your own time. But I'm going to I'm going to share a number of things, even though it's the summary version of the of the book with you today. I would suggest that you take top three areas, pick them and then decide where you think you have a gap between where you want to be and where you are currently and make or put in a lot of effort in terms of closing that gap. So chapter one talks about taking charge of your life. So Suzanne Levine said until you take charge of your life, things don't happen. And I absolutely agree with that. And I think the first step in take in in making self leadership successful is that you need to realize that hang on, it's my life. I need to take charge. We need to live with intent. We can't afford to live on autopilot. John Atkinson said, if you don't run your own life, then somebody else will run it for you. And you need to live the life, and you and I need to live the life that that we've been blessed with. There's been a long a long period of rivalry between Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And, but look at the quotes and how similar these quotes are. Steve Jobs said, you, your time is limited, so don't waste it living somebody else's life. And Bill Gates said, I'm not in competition with anybody but myself. My goal is to improve myself continuously. I get often reminded by, by my dear wife, Marley, that comparison is the death of joy, uh, according to Mark Twain. One of my best friends told me once, and I, and I actually documented it in the book. He said, Aki, the only comparison we should ever make is the comparison with the best version of ourselves. And I can't agree more with him. Internal or external lack of control. Well, I need to ask you, which one do you have? Whenever I was in charge of a, of a division or an organization, and we got, especially at senior level, uh, if we wanted to employ somebody, we did uh, uh, psychometric testing. If that person came back or the results came back and that person had an external locus of control, doesn't matter what the rest of the report looked like, I wouldn't employ that person. Why? Because that person wouldn't take ownership. When it's crunch time, that person will blame somebody else. John Burroughs said, a man can fail many times, but he or she isn't a failure until he or she begins to blame somebody else. The reality more is that more than what we think, we are probably in charge 99 or at least 99% of the time in our lives. 
Planning for Success, Chapter 2. Mike Dennis, I used to work for him way back at NAMPAC. He always told me, success without planning is luck. Planning affects, just like self-leadership, all areas of our lives. It affects our studies, our work environment, professional environment, our hobbies, our sports, and yes, also our, our family lives. And that's why it's so critical. And it's important that we align our plans with our definition of success. And Sweeney said, define success on your own terms, achieve it by your own rules, and build a life that you are proud of, nobody else. And you might ask me today, but Aki, how do I define success on my, on my own terms? Well, here's my answer to that. And I believe firmly that the only measure of personal success is if you can one day look back at your life and truly say with fondness that you are satisfied with what you see and with what you have achieved. The sad thing is that our youth and, and, and goes beyond that, a lot of the people we know are driven by money and define success only in monetary terms. You're only successful if you've got a lot of that stuff. I had a discussion last week with um, a relative that I used to be close to. She is 70 years old. Her personal wealth is somewhere between 100 and 200 million rand. She's alone. She's unhappy. She's not a happy person. And the more I try to convince her to focus on the things that will give her peace, like sharing some of that wealth and 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 ensuring that it does good to other people or adds to their lives, the more she's she's not listening. Define success on your own terms. And it, does, it certainly doesn't need to be financial success. These two topics that I just discussed flows into personal goal setting. And I want you for a second, or maybe after, after today's session, do the newspaper exercise. If your name is Peter, call your newspaper or the front page of your newspaper, or the, the, the Peter Times, or the Jane, if your name is Jane, the Jane Tribune. And go and write down the things that you would like to be on your personal newspaper front cover the day before you die. And it's not a it's not a depressing exercise, it's actually a liberating exercise. And say to yourself what that newspaper cover or that cover page would look like. Zig Ziglar said, if you aim at nothing, you will eat it every time. And it's important that we understand here right now today what we want to aim at in life. You see, you have goal setting in general, but also personal goal setting. Like Stephen Covey said, we need to begin with the end in mind. So you're going to ask me, but Aki, which goals do I document? Which goals do I focus on? And I'm going to tell you on the persisting dreams. And no, not, not those kind of dreams. When I was also in Standard 8, the year I wrote, or I read rather, the, the Power of Positive Thinking, one of the greatest movies ever was released, Top Gun. And for months, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. But then, then I realized that hang on, I'll, I'll probably be too tall and I'm in the wrong country. And that dream faded. It wasn't a persisting dream. But the things that we need to chase very hard and the goals that we need to document are the persisting dreams and your my life. Since I was a school kid, I wanted to learn an African language. And today I'm learning Zulu and I'm getting there. And I've got a goal that I'm working towards hard in terms of being fluent in Zulu. So where do you start? DRI said visualizing your dreams have its own power to complete your dreams, so visualize to accomplish. You start by scripting the, the future areas, not the past areas, the future areas of your life. There's mine. I'm an open book. I, Mark knows me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share. Those are the areas of my life, just broadly speaking. And the question is, after you've completed this balanced wheel, the spider diagram, as far as your specific, your personal life is concerned, what are the persisting dreams in each one of those areas in your life? Because those you need to document. And then I've used my own terminology in the book. Then you need to script your, your, your leadership or your self-leadership charter, which consists of two things. A, your own credo, which defines you. Some people call it your personal mission statement. And then also your personal goal scorecard, which is basically a record of the main personal goals or the primary personal goals with the underlying secondary or supporting personal goals that you would like to achieve in your life. And that personal goal scorecard allows you to, to track your progress towards achieving specific goals at specific dates and, and, and also gauge your percentage progress towards achieving those goals. And you certainly can't do that 
to the document on which you've documented those personal goals. Your personal goal scorecard can't look like that. The reality is that you need to look at it often, at least weekly. Otherwise, nothing will happen. <coughs> so the question you might ask me is, what if we fall behind in terms of goal setting? That is fine. Life happens. We've experienced uh, the last two years that life happens. Darren already said, if your plan isn't working, change the plan, not the goal. Remember, you had a persisting dream in an area. You want to achieve that. So you can't just scratch off the main personal goal that relates to that persisting dream. No, you can potentially change your supporting goals. Yes, you might do that. You can maybe change your deadline dates and move that out slightly. That's fine. But the point is you need to change those. Why? Because if you don't, frankly, you're going to feel one day that you haven't achieved. You're going to feel empty. So setting and document goals, document the goals means only that you're halfway there. That's only halfway. Goal achievement is the most important thing and working hard towards that. Another thing we need to take in mind is that we need to achieve through our goals. Otherwise, you might be like somebody that aspires to and eventually does conquer the peak of um, Mount Everest, but never plans and never makes, make part of that goal to actually not only conquer Mount Everest, but to get, make it safely back to base camp. And then you might be one of or one of one of many of many people that have actually succumbed trying to get from the peak down to base camp. I want to talk to you about avoiding time wasters and distractors. Guys that you know when I say guys, I mean ladies and gentlemen, time's running out. It feels like yesterday that we celebrate my dad's 50th birthday when I was at varsity way back. I'm 52. We all think that Queen made the song The Great Pretender famous, but it's actually banned in the 50s or from the 50s called The Platters. I was running out. And you might say to me, but hang on, I'll get serious about self-leadership and about goal setting next year or the year after that. Guess what? If that's the approach you've got, you will never get to it. Certainly not soon. And then you might also, also say to me, but Aki, I'm 80 years old or I'm 60 or whatever. I've never been serious about this stuff, but I probably don't have time left. And I now might tell you, but hang on, you might get to 95 or 100 years old. What are you going to do for the next 35 years? And the good news is there are ways of catching up. There are ways of manufacturing time to make up for lost time. And you're going to tell me it's impossible. I'm telling you it's possible. I'll give you a couple of examples. There are many more examples in the book. Don't sweat the small stuff. My question to you is, will anybody even be bothered, bothered if you have to prioritize what you're currently busy with in terms of urgent and important. Would everybody, anybody be bothered if you just ignore number eight, nine, and 10 on that list? Probably not. So why are you wasting precious time in focusing those things? Here's another way that where we can absolutely ensure that we are more focused. We are laser focused on what we should be achieving. And yes, most of us, including myself, do have a, a, a form of ADHD, but we need to focus and tell ourselves to focus and we need to focus on the things that needs our attention. Bert Lawn said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why well, fix something that actually works? Yet we sometimes guilty of that. Focus on the things that needs our attention and look at the inverse of this quote. Love it in red. If it ain't OK, then fix it. Delegate. I battled with this for a very long time in my life. Andy Stanley said, only do what only you can do. A lot of lot of you are in senior positions. Only do what only you can do because that's where your organizations need your attention and your expertise. Now, but I don't trust the people below me. Frankly, you need to look at yourself or get other people. Ernest Hemingway said the best way to find out if you can trust somebody is to actually trust them. You need to let go. You need to delegate. And in doing so, you're more, making more time to focus on the things that you should be focusing on. Don't fall beyond your responsibilities. TV license, renewing your driver's license, SARS e-filing, that's that's the one that, 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 that hurts a bit. Renewing your post box. Hello. There are so many things that we fall behind with. Yes, and what happens then? Then we need to get somebody else to sort it out for us. Or we Make need to sure take a day off and we need to actually uh, take a day's leave to go and sort it out. Wasting time. No, no. I'm sure it won't be long.
And then what happens is that we actually also sometimes need to get somebody else to sort it out for us to resolve it. it costs us money, takes time. And frankly, if you don't have the discipline to not fall behind of your responsibilities, put a date in your diary that's a month earlier. If SARS e-filing needs to be split by 22nd of November, put in your diary is 22nd of October until you've generated enough discipline in your life oh, to be able to, 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 to make that deadline. Uh, sorry, guys, okay. somebody's, somebody's not on mute. If you wouldn't mind just okay, switching great. to Thanks. mute, um, I would okay. really appreciate that. Thank you. So the, the bottom line is that if you then over, overstep that deadline and you moved uh, forward by, by, by a month, then you will still be in time by two weeks. Check your own mind if you have to, but don't fall behind your responsibilities. I want to talk to you about living a disciplined life. I once had a conversation a couple of years ago with Dario Farida that heads up the African Leadership Institute in Namibia when we spoke about what does leadership entail. And he said, Aki, as leaders, we need to focus on becoming whole and complete. I think it's, it's beautiful and it's profound. And the biggest thing I, I believe that stands in our way as leaders and developing self-leaders is discipline. And that stops us from becoming whole and complete. Professor Albus Dumbledore said from the Harry Potter fame, he said, we must all face the choice between what is right and what is easy every single day. Not easy, but it's something we need to work on. I want to talk about the fallacy of intermittent discipline. Discipline is not something that is a light switch. Today I'm disciplined, tomorrow I'm not. Yes, we are human. So maybe not 100% of the time, but certainly 99.9% .9 of the time, we have to live a disciplined life. And that's the life we need to live. We can't be disciplined when I'm with my family, but when I go on a hunting trip with my mates or golf trip down to the south, south coast, then uh, I'm not disciplined. It doesn't work like that. So you might ask me, Aki, why even bother with discipline? Well, I think Stephen Covey summarized nicely when he said, only the disciplined are truly free, the undisciplined are slaves to moods, appetites, and distractions. Don't you just feel great when you put your head on that pillow and you go to bed at night and you felt and you feel that you've lived a disciplined day and that you've actually been on the receiving end of the rewards that's linked to it. Stop making excuses, chapter six. Our personal goals don't care about our excuses. And what's our number one excuse right now? Probably COVID. And then my question to you is, but then why do so many people thrive in a COVID era? Or so many companies thrive in a COVID era? It's because they decided they're not going to use this as an excuse. And for no second in saying that, I'm ignoring all the things that, 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 that we inherited as part of the, the COVID pandemic. You see, an excuse is a story that you tell yourself to sell yourself. And it limits our experiences and our horizons. It's from a book from Sam Silverstein called No More Excuses. It's on my shelf at home. This guy is John Morrow. You might not know who he is. He's the most successful blogger in the world. He became wealthy purely through, through blogging. And he was born with SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. According to doctors, he should have died by now. And he can only move his face. Yet, he's the most successful blogger in the world. So he writes by controlling a keyboard simulator with his mouth, speech rec and speak re speech recognition technology. So the question that I've got for you and me is, so what's our excuse? And I talked about surviving tough times. So important if we, if we along our, or throughout our self-leadership journey. When I was in standard nine, most of you would recall Billy Ocean released a song when the tough gets going, the guy, or when the going gets tough, rather, the tough gets going. Bill Gates says, life is not fair, get used to it. Now, none of these two, two areas or quotes or song names actually assist us in digging deep. But the reality is, we cannot change the cards we are dealt with, just how we play the hand. There's a couple of, couple of silver linings uh, though around getting through and trying to get through tough times. Norman Vincent Peale said, the only people who don't have problems are in a cemetery. And Benjamin Disraeli said, there's no education like adversity. And you would you would agree with me that when we go through tough times and we say to ourselves, please, I don't, I, I don't want to experience this right now, but I have to. 
Then we get to the other side and we realize, but hang on, I've learned a lot through this process. And the reality is we you are never alone. I do e-mentoring coaching as well as part of uh, what I do for a living in terms of developing leaders. And so often people that I engage with tells me that, listen, but I don't want to burden somebody else with my issues. That's nonsense. The other people, especially those that are close to you, would love to help you in your tough times, in your bad times. So please, my invitation to you is share because those people would love to assist you in whatever you are dealing with and going through. So our challenge is, as successful self-leaders is that we need to adopt a mindset that where we see adversity as opportunity. We need to take and grab and, and catch those proverbial lemons and make lemonade from it. And in tough times especially, one of our challenges is that we need to put away the whip. Jeez, I'm experiencing what I'm currently experiencing. It's all my fault. What is the good in that? How can that assist you? Especially in tough times, look after yourself and be kind to yourself. That feeds or leads into improving our resilience. Refusing to give up. We all get knocked down at times. But we need to draw the, la the, the, the line in the sand and say to ourselves, I will never give up. The Japanese proverb says, fall down seven times and stand up eight. And COVID has, has, has certainly give us, given us a new perspective on life. And I think in, in many instances, many, many, many people wanted to and did, did eventually give up. But the reality is, as successful self-leaders or working towards self-leadership success, we need to make sure and take the responsibility of making sure that we will be geared for the next COVID. And there will be next COVID. It might not be called COVID, but on a global or national level, there will be a COVID or two or three in the remainder of our lives. But certainly on another front, as a third option, is the fact that we, on a personal level, will have a lot of COVIDs in our lives, albeit somebody else or something else that we call it. And we need to be geared to be resilient enough to be able to handle that. So how do I deal with stress? And you're going to ask me, why do I ask this in the context of being becoming more resilient? Well, the bottom line is, if you find ways to, on a frequent basis, deal with your stress, then you will naturally become more resilient. And it's important that we get into that habit and that we do that. There are many ways of dealing with stress. I can share with you two of, of the many things in the rest of the book. What I do, I look at my fortnightly diary once a week at a specific time, and I do the rolling fortnightly planning. And in doing that, the creative side of my brain starts to work on stuff to be able to deal with deadlines and to be able to, to make a success of those. And that makes me sleep much better at night because I know it's covered. There's nothing that's you sure there, there are things that are unplanned, but by and large, there's nothing that lurks around the corner that might catch me out. I charge my batteries, my life batteries, and I do it frequently. My dad taught me two good things amongst all the things that he taught me. Love water or love for water and the love for riding motorcycles. And I do both those things frequently. And that allows me to charge my batteries and to be able to handle life's knocks much better. Question I've got for you is how do you handle feedback? I used to handle negative feedback badly. Now I've basically ask only for negative feedback because that's where I can learn from. We need to more have a crocodile skin. We need to take less things or things less personally. And the feedback we got or get or receive, if it's the guy on the right hand side that's got evil intentions uh, and it's got plans that's not in your good interest, ignore that feedback. But take the feedback from the guy on the left, the sages, the people in, the in your life that you look up to. Chapter nine, taking charge of our emotions. Critical. And I always say rather EQ than IQ. Um, I used to work with HR exec. Her name is Debbie Sinclair, and I want to go by putting her name next to the quote. She used to say, at the point where someone's nuisance value starts to exceed the value that she or he is adding to the organization, then it's time for that person to leave that organization. May you and I, as, as developing self-leaders, never ever be guilty of that. You see, we need to set personal boundaries, talking about the proverbial line in the sand. 
Many years ago, I told myself, I will never, ever, ever, especially in a public forum, specifically in a public forum, like a meeting, take the bait when somebody's trying to throw it out there and try to challenge me. And I won't, whatever it takes, I won't get emotional or lose my cool. See, Abraham Lincoln said, better to remain silent to be thought of a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt. You remember the Madagascar or the movie Penguins of Madagascar? Sometimes you need to adopt this approach, even though you won't want to. Just smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. One of the exec teams I worked for, we used to say, make like a duck. So what does it mean? It means exactly that. You don't let, allow ever your stress and your emotions to boil over to the point of beyond the surface. Above the surface, you smile and you've got that in your dial, and you are cool, calm and collected. You certainly create the impression that you are in control and that your team have things under control. And below the surface, you might be paddling like mad, but that's fine. You need to make like a duck. So a word from Marley, my wife, she always uh, reminds me, she says, you cannot control someone else's emotions and actions. You can only control your own emotions and your response to somebody else's actions. Many years ago, I would root at a taxi when he made a U-turn in front of me. Now, I just wait for him. When he looked me in the eye after he made the U-turn, I'll wave at him. Not because I'm perfect, no, but because I've worked on this point and I'm actually proud of myself in being able to do that. Taking charge of our emotions. Living in the present moment, critical. Lao Tzu said, if you're depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. But if you're at peace, you're living in the present. Remember the movie Click? It was released in 2007. I went to watch the movies. Uh, not a big Adam Sandler fan, but it's, it was a great movie, a great lesson. We got this remote and we fast forwarded the phases or the instances in his life that wasn't pleasant. And then he realized all of a sudden at the end of his life, but hang on. I'm close to the end of my life and I've actually just fast forwarded my life in the character he played of, of Michael Newman. We can't afford to do that. We need to experience every single moment in our lives, even though it's it's a tough moment. So the question is, are you a pilgrim or are you a tourist? I was once confronted with this question in a sermon and a, a tourist typically wants to do the highlights package. Get onto a plane, get onto a taxi, and only see and experience the highlights. Pilgrim will walk to his destination or her destination. Experience the sun against your, your face, the wind in your uh, wind against your, your your skin, the rain, the birds, the sounds, barefoot, etc. etc. Experiencing and appreciating every single moment. Ad get is a biker term. Being on the wrong side of of of, of, of this half century. Um, where I was a boy in, at, in Standard 3, way back, uh, rode without a helmet, without anything. My bones are brittle now. So I have to conform to Adgate, motorcycling term, all the gear, all the time. So I used to only think of the riding experience as turning the throttle and experiencing that amazing feeling. Now I understand where it used to be a burden and we are, I actually didn't, didn't want to do short, short distance rides because of it. And I understand part of the experience is to gear up, putting all this stuff on my, onto my body, including my neck brace, and to gear down again afterwards. That's part of the experience. And it's not only about turning a throttle. My message to you is don't let your future be the thief of your present. Because here's the thing. You're going to think one day you became 80 or 85 or 90, but actually you only live till 60. Why? Because a third of your life or a quarter of your life you wished away. Improving your self-confidence. And we talked about the power of, of self-talk and how critical that is. And I just love this picture where it says self-talk is the most powerful form of communication because it either empowers you or it defeats you. How do you talk to yourself? Are you telling yourself I can't do it? Or are you telling yourself I can do it? In what you're telling yourself, are you flipping the switch towards be, being your own worst enemy? Or, which I hope is the case, flipping it to the bottom and being your own best friend. 
Dain and day out. This, uh, everybody in the school is over 16, so I'm just going to read it as it is. Quote from Jordan Belford, who was the real wolf of Wall Street. He said, and it's actually a fridge magnet on my fridge at home, to keep on reminding myself of this. He said, the only thing standing between you and your goal is the bullshit story. You keep telling yourself as to why you can't achieve it. You have to believe it, that you are good enough. A friend of mine a couple of months ago told me something, and let's call him Peter. I said, Peter, rule number one in life is you do not sell yourself short ever. Because here's the thing, our self-worth is much more important than our net worth. I'm going to talk to you about choosing to be positive. Because you see, optimism is a choice. Marley and I, probably four or five years ago, we had breakfast at home on a Saturday morning, and she has got this amazing superhuman ability to always be an optimist, which I can't really understand, and I will never understand it. But till this day, when it became more clearer to me, I was saying something negative, I can't even remember what it was, and she looked at me, and I could see the daggers coming from her eyes towards me. And I said, what? She said, you know what, Becky? Optimism is a choice. You choose to be positive. And that is the day that the penny actually dropped to me. Norman Cousins said, optimism doesn't wait on facts. It deals with prospects. And pessimism is a waste of time. And I can't agree more. Privilege. Whenever we feel negative about something, let's just remind ourselves as to what we've got. William Penn said, the secret of happiness is to count your blessings while other people or adding up their troubles. We are all, most of us in the school are in Africa. These are the facts. More than 40% of the population in Africa have to live or, or live on less than $1.90 per day. You see, if you can get along and survive on less than 20, 29 rand a day, and yet more than 55 million people in our continent need needs to do it or need to do it. And please, whatever you do, speak positively. And please don't ever work as an example, refer to work-life balance. Because in saying that, you're, you're insinuating that work isn't life. I used to say, I have to. I have to go to work. I have to go to gym. That's nonsense. If you have to go to work, get another job. Because you don't, you don't enjoy your work or your job enough. I have to go to gym. That's nonsense. You don't have to do anything. My vocabulary now says, I want to go to gym. I want to go to my office. Leaving your comfort zones. Chapter 13. Because that's where the learning and the growing takes place. That's where the magic happens. Outside of your current comfort zone. William Cox said, life will only change when you become more committed to your dreams than you are committed to your comfort zone. And to, to me, the asset test, especially in our geographical context, is around diversity and inclusion. That's where the real test is of getting out of our comfort zones. Kwame Nkrumah, who used to be a statesman, a statesman up, up north, he said Africa is one continent, one people, and one nation. And we have to believe that. I had the privilege of, of having had a lot of uh, stadium experiences um, of Earlier in my corporate career, especially, I used to travel a lot. Uh, also went, for example, to the Emirates Cup, um, Arsenal Stadium, to watch a couple of games there in uh, 2015. But I've never, ever, ever experienced what I've experienced a couple of k's away from where I'm now. At FNB Stadium, this was the second time I was there, uh, enjoying it with, with Marley, my wife. The FNB local derby between Soweto, uh, or between Kaiser Chiefs rather and Orlando Pirates. Best stadium experience ever. The way we were embraced and welcomed. Totally different level. And now I'm learning Zulu. Talking about getting out of my comfort zone. Learning a new language at the age of 52. Chapter 14. Learning and living good habits. So critical as far as our self-leadership journey is concerned. Joanna just said, In a nutshell, your health, wealth, happiness, fitness, and your success depend on your habits. I used to be a yes bad guy. Don't you just hate those people? Stephen Covey said, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the in intent to, uh, to reply. I used to be that guy. Annoying. Now that I look back. People that think uh, that only their perspective matters. I've also grown up. 
I've also become more successful along my self leadership journey. And now I do, and I tell myself to apply what the ref used to say in as far as the previous rules are concerned in setting the scrum in rugby union. Now I tell myself, pause, wait for three seconds, process what that person's trying to tell me, and then I engage. I want to talk to you about sample habits. You're going to tell me, Aki, I can't do habits, my habits for next month because it's budget time, or whatever your excuse is. I'm too busy. Well, my advice to you would be then apply sample habits. If I can't do 60 laps in the pool and I'm too busy, I don't stop doing it because I know it's good for me. It's part of a good routine. It keeps me healthy. I go and do 20, 20 laps. Or if I can't get on, get to the gym and, and uh, spend that time, I take the dog for a walk with my wife. Take our dog for a walk and, and at least get some exercise through doing that. Takes me five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes only maybe. Chapter 15, value personal branding. How critical is that? What does your brand look like? Are you a Ferrari or BM? Or are you a Tata? And I'm not saying the one is better than the other. You can judge and you can make that call. So the question I've got for you is what is your personal brand right now? And are you focusing enough and investing enough in building that personal brand? If I have to give you three photos or three characters, which one of those would you reckon has the best and strongest personal brand? And which one has the least? And I hope you've actually given and or given the answer in the order from left to right with Madiba having the, the best and strongest personal brand. Beating or at least keeping your promises. To me, this is the crux of personal brand equity. Tom Peters said, formula for success is under promise and over deliver. Just one aspect of that is so many people that make New Year's resolutions, right? We're all part of that, that clan. Facts are, this is the stats, the real stats, that 80% of those New Year resolutions never become reality. Not only are you breaking a promise, you're breaking a promise to the single most important person in your life that you should never betray or break a promise to yourself. I'm going to talk to you about leading by a good example. Mahatma Gandhi said, my life is my message. And I don't really follow American politics that much, but with his inaugural speech, I, I wrote this quote down after I heard it on, on the radio when he was inaugurated as president. Joe Biden said, we lead not merely by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. Cherishing relationships. I want to submit that you can't be a successful self-leader if you don't cherish, cherish relationships. The Spirit of African Leadership uh, was written by Love Mombichi. I've got a signed copy on my shelf at home, and I love this. He said, it is in the courageous encounter with others that we discover our personal path and purpose in life. You see, the charity begins at home. Mother Teresa said, if you want to change the world, Go home and love your family. My son asked me once, Dad, how long did your PhD take you? And I actually did the calculation. It took me between three and 4,000 hours. Yes, that's how long it took me. And my poor wife needed to become the best pottery artist, if you want to call it. Um, the one, of the one of the better dot artists to the point where she actually uh, presents classes as an expert just to support me and, and to actually be on our own and, and, and do things on our own while I was finishing my PhD. Why? Because she believes in our marriage and she believes in our relationship and I would no question do exactly the same for her. It starts at home. You see, the reality is like so many things that I've discussed today that is that to cherish relationship is also a choice. You might tell me, okay, it's been tough times, COVID, etc. I can't give money to somebody else. That's fine. But my question to you is and to myself is, do you have time? You cherish and show that you cherish relationships. Can you donate blood? Fair enough. Not all of us can can phys physically do it, but if you can, why don't you do it? When last did you compliment the chef and tell to tell him that listen and to make his day by saying, as opposed to receiving all those critic critical comments every single day on his side, to tell him listen, well done, to ask for the waiter to call the chef and say you prepared a super meal. Thank you very much. Put a smile on the dial. If you approach somebody, even if it's a, a, a stranger, 
wave at somebody. I will never ever drive past somebody that's asking for money at a, at a stop street or robot traffic light without looking at that person, looking him in the eye and acknowledging him. Not because I'm a saint, but because my dear wife also told me and reminds me every single day that that person is a person, is a human being, and I acknowledge that person. You see, here's the secret. If I knew this earlier in my life and three decades ago in my life, for example, I would have started doing it much more. But the more you cherish relationships and the more you give to others, the more you receive back tenfold. Making time to invest in reflecting. You're going to ask me, why do I need to reflect? Well, self-reflection, according to the Oxford Dictionary, says it means it's serious thought about one's character and our actions. We have to take stock. We have to, on a frequent basis, ensure that we are heading in the right direction that we want to be heading in life. We need to, in this or on this treadmill that we're running on hard and fast, we need to make time to stop and say, whoa, where am I heading? What am I doing? Because otherwise, frankly, it will lead to burnout. So I, I, I had to reflect a little bit tongue in cheek. Forgive me for this. Um, one example is you can you can get a good book on self leadership, uh, and you can use it to, to reflect. There are many ways. Here's here's another example. I've got a annual calendar in my garage. Whenever I get home in the afternoon, so half past five, six o'clock, I take one of the two highlighters that's next to that calendar. You can go into my garage now. You'll see it. If it was a good day, I'll let you stand before that. Uh, calendar before I get into the kitchen and meet with my family and I would mark that date. If it was a day where I wasn't proud of what I've achieved from a, from a self-leadership point of view or personal leadership point of view, I would mark it orange and I will reflect on what can I do some next time to make it better. If it was a good day and I was proud of myself and I think I've achieved what I should have achieved, then I mark it a green day. Or you can use a personal goal scorecard, which unfortunately we don't have time to get into the detail of it, but that's pretty much the first page of it. And you can use that to reflect on a frequent basis. I want to talk about the power of the next time. Whenever you've stuffed up, use this. Tell yourself after reflecting on it, but the next time, but the next time I'll do this and this and this, and I'll do better. With one provisor though, you can't say that every time because then you become a repeat offender and then you'll never address or correct your behavior and the way you show up, show up in the workplace or at, at, at home. Embracing that it's never too late. See, as Lewis said, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can certainly start where you are and change the ending. Doesn't matter where you are. You're 50, 60, 70, 80. These two guys, Ray Kroc and Walt Disney, have two things in common. They both served together. They, they knew each other in the ambulance corps in the First World War. But also, they were both late bloomers. Ray Kroc franchised the first McDonald's store when he was 52. And Walt Disney opened the first Disney park when he was 53 years old. Never too late. But it's important, whatever we decide, that we finish strong. I finished reading his book in December 2020 when I isolated as a result of, of uh, getting COVID. And that also inspired me to write the book. So important to finish strong. It's a good read, by the way. I can re recommend it. George Eliot said, it is never too late to be or to become what you might have been. The choice is yours. Second last chapter. Carl Jung, the Swiss psychiatrist, said, I'm not what happened to me. I am what I choose to become. Why? For your sake. For your sake, you need to make that choice, but also for the sake of those people around you, especially those people that are close to you and that are part of your inner circle. So in closing, you might tell me, Aki, so what? So what is, so why are you sharing this stuff with us today? It's common sense. Yeah, it might be. My question to you then is, why is there a gap between where you ideally would be along your self-leadership success or journey and where you're currently rating yourself right now, today. 
Well, I'm going to finish off and then leave you with two questions. And the first question is, is your self-leadership journey on track? Because you need to answer that question. Because if it's not, you might one day sit in an old age home and you might have a smile on the dial, but actually deep down you might be thinking, hang on, there was so much more. Could have achieved so much more. I could have been so much more successful as far as my personal leadership is concerned. But forget about it one day. Let's talk about today. When you go to bed tonight, are you going to lie and before you close your eyes and you fall to sleep, are you going to tell yourself, I am proud of myself. It's been a great day on all fronts in the way I've interacted, in the way that I showed up, in, the, in what I've achieved, and I'm actually really proud of myself. Because if you're not, you might want to consider this question. Is your self-leadership journey on track? And my second question to you is, what is the legacy that you will leave behind? My grandfather passed away, one of my grandfathers, when he was 46 years old only. I was four years old at the time. My recollection or my memories of him was not that he did woodwork, like in this photo with me, that he, that he picked me up and put me on his lap and read me a story or played with me on the carpet with a matchbox. Remember the, all the guys on the, on the on the call, on the session, the matchbook with a matchbox car. No, my only memories of him is that he was an alcoholic. Uh, he was, uh, he smoked himself to death. He died of emphysema and lung cancer eventually at the age of 46. And he was an abusive man to the point where my mother at 74 still battles to work through that stuff that he did. And he also did to, to, to her and, and, and to my grandma. So I wish I could tell him today that at 46, you haven't lived your life yet. And at 46, you could have made the decision to get your personal or your self-leadership journey on track. And have actually made sure that you left a legacy behind where I could have today, with pride, have shared it with you. So here's the scary thing about legacy, ladies and gentlemen, is that leaving a legacy is about the legacy that you leave behind today. If the proverbial bus hits you after this call on your way home, and God forbid that it doesn't happen, the legacy that you leave behind today, that is your legacy. And the question is, are you happy with the legacy and that legacy that you leave behind? So part of what we need is hope. I believe, especially getting through a COVID period. Look what it says, what it says on the inside of the O. Hope is inside all of us. And I firmly believe that. And I firmly believe that's where it starts. So if we go back to this slide, I believe that if we intentionally influence our thinking, feeling, and behaviors to, amongst other things, achieve our full potential, live the legacy that makes us proud, and to lay the foundation to lead other people better, then we will absolutely create hope. So you might more ask me, Aki, but you're leaving me with all this stuff. What do I do next? Well, I want to suggest a couple of, if I may, next steps to you in terms of your self-leadership journey. The fact that the, the mere fact that you are on this call, part of the session, tells me that you are interested in, in this stuff and that you take your self-leadership journey seriously. So kudos to you and you've ticked that box. So well done. But I want to invite you to pause more in your life. I want you to suggest to you that you make time to reflect more. Also that you go and reflect on the gap in terms of what I mentioned earlier of in any area of your life of where you are and where you ideally would like to be. And what are you going to do to actively close that gap and to leave the legacy that you want to leave behind whenever you exchange this life for the next and to really work, work hard at it. Nothing comes from nothing. And like anything else, we need to work on this specific aspect of our, of our lives very hard to make a success of it. So why? Well, for the best reason ever, to make yourself proud. So if you're interested in buying my book, uh, it's in paperback available from my website. I'll get to that just now. From all Outlets basically exclusive books, bargain books, take a lot amongst others in ebook format 
Amazon Kindle, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, and many more. And if you buy the book from soldati.com, our website, uh, we've got a promo running. We also mentioned it in the, in the invitation to you for today's session. Till Monday morning, next Monday the 14th at 8 o'clock, um, you will get 50 Rand off. Uh, if you go into the book launch tab, um, you click on you would you like to get a signed copy of not or not. Uh, and then if you view a cart after you've, you've uh, gone beyond that step, you could actually, you, or, or I'd suggest you then um, in the coupon field, you just type in, it's not case sensitive, 50 rand for free, like I've done top left or the bottom left rather of, of the screen in the, in the red circle, 50 rand for free, you click on apply coupon and it uh, deducts 50 rand of your purchase. So today's presentation, like Mark mentioned, will be on my website or our website from Friday morning under the resources tab under insights as a blog. I want to end off with my best quote ever, and it's on a box in my lounge from Madiba. A quote that I love the most from Madiba that says, there's no passion to be found playing small in settling for a life that is less than the one that you are capable of living. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, fortunately or unfortunately the end. I want to say to you again a monster big thank you. And I'm going to hand over for questions uh, to Mark. And if you ever want to contact me, feel free to phone me on my cell phone or email me. It'll be a privilege to, uh, and a pleasure to talk to you. Okay, Mark, and I'll, that's yeah. over to you, sir. Thank you, Hecky. Yeah, uh, much appreciated. Guys, I, I feel that a few people have, have mentioned that they needed to drop off. Um, please, if you've, I've got two questions already and a, and a, and a question from Doug uh, Cairns. Doug, I think you're still on the, on the call if you'd like to come through. Um, and if anyone else would like to put their hand up to help me out, please, uh, please do that. Uh, otherwise, I'll go to the questions that we, we received earlier. Doug, uh, please fire away. Yeah. Hey, Keith, firstly, thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, a, a lot of food for thought there and uh, some some stuff that uh, is, is well remembered. Uh, I particularly like the way you focused on self-leadership. I think we tend to, as leaders, focus on leading others rather than looking at ourselves first. So I think this is an important focus and thank you for that. Uh, the question I want to ask you is, given your studies and, and uh, possibly your ongoing research into the area, what do you think the emerging key challenges are for leaders as we live in such changing times, digital times, with COVID, et cetera, et cetera, all, all these things that, that throw curved balls at us? Yeah, Doug, thanks for that. Uh, I think, um, and you might tell me, Aki, you're stating the obvious. But I think the biggest dilemma we faced with as a as a nation, as a, as a continent, maybe specifically, but also as a world, is, you know, that we we that a COVID might have caused us to to lose our way. And what I mean by that is that, specifically with focus on ethics, I think one thing that we need more than ever is 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 to hold our leaders and our society accountable in order to to become or, or, or revert back or focus more on ethical leadership. You know, I, I drive around through Joburg, especially after the new year, and I just see, yes, uh, the weather caused bottles, but let's not make that an excuse, but grass ain't, ain't cut. Uh, robots, are, uh, traffic lights are ran, uh, run over and, and nobody tends to it, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm thinking to myself, but we're paying taxes and where's that going? And uh, I think, we need to hold our leaders accountable more, whatever it takes. And I think the biggest emerging thing, if I can pick one, Doug, is ethical leadership. Thanks, Thank Hickey. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Doug. you, Doug. Um, Hickey, uh, one of the questions that was sent through a little earlier, um, how do we start with the spider diagram of our main personal issues? You put it up quite quite quickly, Hickey. Um, and the the person wants to know how do we go about developing that spider diagram for ourselves? Right. So it's 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 it's, it's very very uh, simple, Mark. So what we what we just very very briefly what you do is 
if you can see that again. Yeah, it's that one. Yes, yeah, that was so, it. So, so look, look at look at what what my areas are. So, so uh, pick any area. So what I'm saying is is very important. Not the past areas of your life, your future areas, the areas that you see as part of your future life. Go and categorize those areas and put it on that spider di spider diagram or balance wheel. Okay, and typically it it might be religion, your spouse, your kids, your family, uh, sports, hobbies, and I can carry on. And, and literally just go and identify different areas of, of your life. And then following from that, say to yourself, what do I want to achieve in this area of my life? This area of my life is, is, is part of my life for good reason. And surely I want to be successful in this area. And what is my dream to achieve in this area? And then translate that into a goal and chase that goal hard, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, OK, so yeah, it does make sense, Hickey. Thanks. But but your, your categories are obviously personal. And yep. um, um, I see self-development, religion, wife, kids, family, mm. your business and something called the, the character company. How would how would one of the individuals online this afternoon go about coming up with their eight? Is it the most important issues in their future life? Yeah, it's a, so it's simply if I can go out, it's simply saying to yourself, what are the areas of my life? And it doesn't <laughs> need to be eight. It can be three and okay. four. What I want to encourage you is that it's not one or two or three or four. Okay. Because bearing in mind, if somebody says it's only work, I work 12 hours a day because I think my boss expects that from me, which is nonsense. And if you go and ask your boss, he will tell you that. But my point is, if you rely on only one area of your life and everything is only focused on that and you lose that area of your life, you get fired. It's called what it is. Then, you've, then, then what do you do? Yeah. As opposed to having different areas of your life, that if you lose one, at least the other areas in your life can carry you through and support you to survive through that tough time. OK, thanks, Heki. That, that that makes sense. And would you recommend that the guys online use a mentor to help with them with that? Or is that a personal is that a personal development role that we have to play? So I, I think if, if you if you're battling the stuff and you, you, uh, you you're getting at a crossroads and you, you're not making progress, Absolutely. I think it, it will be good to to get somebody else that you can trust in, in, in a confidential coaching or mentoring relationship, uh, even if it's only for a limited amount of sessions. Um, it helped in my case. I had an executive coach for many years or for a number of years. And uh, absolutely, if you get stuck, do whatever it takes, like seeing somebody else in, in, in that kind of relationship to get you, get you out of that rut and to be able to, to, to get your, your journey on track again. Great. Thanks, Heki. Uh, a completely different question. Have you ever had a situation where someone other than the CEO manages the leadership process in an organization because the CEO is ineffective? Um, I haven't experienced it, but what I can tell you is that if, if that happens, I would walk away. Oh. Because if the leadership, if, if, if the CEO doesn't drive um, leadership development and 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 it does, isn't supportive of the process. Doesn't matter what it it will all probability and the, obviously there are exceptions. In all probability, it won't be a success yeah. because it's not driven from the top and it's not supported from the top. Right. And um, last one from the ones that have come through so far, Hickey. If you were to describe self leadership, what do you think are the five main issues? that we on the call today should think about as we close this afternoon? Mark, I was hoping you're not going to put me on the spot. Is that too too difficult? Like you mentioned 15 no, no, chapters no, no, or no, something. No, please, please let me respond to that. That's just a, uh, uh, um, So I think if, if you look at the definition of self-leadership, first and foremost, it's around goal setting. OK, and then in terms of goal setting, ask yourself for your sake and for the people around you. How can I focus on which area should I be focusing as far as my thoughts, my emotions or feelings and my behavior is concerned, where I think I'm lacking at this point the most. And I think it's it's, it's different, it's different for, for each person. Yeah. Uh, what are those areas that I need to focus on? Because I might be I might be proficient or, or might have mastered EQ. Um, and in fact, all the all the areas that I've shared with you this today, is which is only which is only a, a sample of what's here, um, might appeal to some people in terms of 
areas that they should be focusing or not. Uh, you know, we can pick them. Uh, after, after goal setting, uh, EQ, I think, is, is, is critical. Um, uh, you know, they all, I see this comment that came up, EQ versus IQ. To me, that is, that is so, so critical. Um, and, and we can run down the list, but I think it's literally a question of um, look at what I've presented, but what appeals to you and which areas you haven't mastered, getting back to the top three that I've mentioned in the beginning of the presentation. Fantastic. I've got two two other hands as I, as I can see it from my side, Doug. Uh, sorry, Heki, uh, uh, Skalk. Uh, Skalk, and I know Skalk is in the leadership space as well. Skalk, go ahead. Skalk. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Heki. Um, I think from my experience, just something I, I'd like to share, you know what I, um, in the executive coaching sphere, also what I discuss with clients is that, you know, and someone asked the question earlier, what is our meaning of success? And, you know, success becomes wider. And I use, um, it's, it's, it's not a triangle, but more of a diamond diagram that, you know, IQ being one of them, your intellect that's fairly uh, fixed, that, that that is not something we can really uh, uh, work with. But then what Heke had mentioned on the one side, you know, EQ, um, the emotional intelligence side, that certainly it is a skill that can be acquired. But then also something called PQ, the physical side of it, and that does not necessarily only look at, at the health aspects, but health, finance, fitness, um, relationships, everything around it. So also related and linked to your EQ. And then something that I refer to as the SQ or the spiritual intelligence and not necessarily in any religious sense, but rather um, wisdom, compassion, that sixth sense that we as human beings later in life um, discover um, to to be aware of that, capitalize on that, and, and use it to our advantage. So yes, it becomes more broad and all encompassing. Yeah. Um, and I think that 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 to me is where the value, you know, it's not just one lever and to get that holistic view of, you know, balancing life. And we spoke about that circle, you know, in terms of, of IQ, my capability, what is it that I do, um, knowledge, skills, experience, but the EQ, the SQ, and then the, the PQ, how do all of those factors balance um, my overall success and outlook in life? Um, just yeah. my contribution. Yeah. Thank you for that. No, thank Skog, you. Skog, thanks. For, if you can comment on that, uh, Mark. Uh, Skog, thanks for that. And I absolutely agree with what you're saying. Um, you know, the, the field of, of self-leadership is, is so wide. Um, absolutely, those things you mentioned are, 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 are part of it. And if, 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 if anything, I wanted to, you know, you can decide what you need to focus on in terms of achieving the definition of self-leadership and achieving your goals. Um, and if anything, I wanted to today plant that seed that this is so important and we need to first and foremost start with, with the concept of self-leadership and also including all the things that you've mentioned now, Skok, uh, as part of that journey uh, before we can even think of, of, of optimally lead others. And it, it needs to start with self. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Hickey. Guys, uh, we, we've, we've dealt with the questions that have come through. If anyone else uh, has a question for Hickey, please uh, put your hand up. Uh, otherwise, what we'll do is we'll do the uh, thank yous uh, and we'll have finished within time and budget, which is always a good thing. It's a personal goal setting uh, issue. Any any other any other questions for Hickey? Um, if not, ladies and gents, on your behalf, could I thank uh, Hecky van der Vesthuizen for taking the time, energy and effort to be with us this afternoon. Um, a specific thank you to Roy Marto, and I know that he's had to leave uh, the session, uh, but thank you to Roy who helped us uh, put it together on a webinar Wednesday, apparently. I didn't know that existed, but apparently it's a thing. Um, and his organization, the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce, and the EU Chamber of Commerce. To my own uh, organization, BISA, and the Italians, Belgians, uh, and other colleagues, uh, we're very grateful for your support. So ladies and gents, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the afternoon session. Um, as, as mentioned earlier on, the, um, the recording will be available. Uh, we will be working on shortening it just a little bit to make it uh, easier to uh, to transfer and for you to access. And should you wish a copy of the book, 
Hecky has has made an opportunity for you uh, to get that at a reduced price. So, ladies and gents, thank you for your time. I hope you found uh, it worthwhile. It was great to be with you, and we look forward to seeing you uh, in the near future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Much appreciate it. Bye bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank Just you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Cheers. Thanks, David. Cheers, everybody. Bye.